this podcast guest, Michael. It is thanks for coming on. And first of all, let's let's start. We're, we're going to the owner meetings this week, but I want to start with the moves that have happened. I haven't talked to you, at least on here, about the impact you feel about Carson Wentz. What do you feel the impact of that move has been? Well, it, it buys you time to, to figure out what you want to do. I, you know, it, in a very best case scenario, he's the answer, and, and he's the answer, and you, you give him a long term deal, and everybody's happy, and you live happily ever after. I, I tend to believe that's not going to happen. Now, look, he's shown he's played at that level before. It's on tape, you can see it. I, I don't even buy these character issues that that that's going to be a major thing either I just think this is a guy who's been through a lot of injuries and has, has played a lot of football and, and sometimes it's, it's tough to regain your form after all that you know we've seen that so many times over the years I think it's far more likely he's he's good he's fine he's an upgrade over Taylor Heineke um, but ultimately this team's still searching for the answer and uh, you know the the eternal search for the answer I, I think will continue and, yeah and I think to what he's an, I agree, he's an upgrade. And I do agree too, that sometimes those other issues pop up when you're hurt, because there are other quarterbacks who have played well in this league who have similar issues. They're just really productive. So it doesn't come out the same way. So what level do you think adding him gets this team to? If, if they're, I would say, if they're healthy, if they're relatively healthy, because nobody's ever fully healthy, relatively good health, what level does he get them to, do you think? I think it's fair to expect a playoff appearance next year. And I, I know that's a lot to put on a coach in a very competitive division. Let's call it what it is. Uh, you know, people love to rag on the NFC East, but I, I think the Giants are going to take a step forward. I think the Eagles have a lot of talent on that roster. And obviously nobody's going to say anything other than the Cowboys need to make the playoffs next year with that, that group they've assembled. But I don't think it's an unfair expectation to put on these guys. Look, you know, we can say whatever we want to say about the offense, but this defense underachieved for large portions of the season last year. It's a group with a lot of talent. And I think the, to me, the big storyline next year is not Carson Wentz, but, it, but the big storyline next year is can this defense hit that next year, that elite level and win games week in and week out because they should, because that, you know, you spend that many draft picks, that much time, that much action on a defense. I think they need to come, come deliver at a, at a higher level. And I think Carson Wentz allows you to feel better about that. You know, a game I keep referencing back is that game in Denver last year, you know, where it chase young makes, for, for my money, the individual play of the year. Late in the game, the Broncos are running out the clock. All they have to do is run out the clock, and he still gets in that backfield, snap, forces a fumble, forces it, you know, their ball all of a sudden, chance to win the game, and Heineke can't deliver the win. Wentz is going to deliver in that situation. You bring in a guy of that caliber, he's going to win that game for him. So it's about making sure when your defense goes elite, do you back it up with a good enough offense to take advantage of it? And I think there's a few games they would have won with the better, better, better quarterback play. But with the defense, I have theories about why they, what they can do to be better and what went wrong. And as you know, all those theories are accurate and correct. So, but I, <laughs> I'm curious, what do you think has to happen for this defense to take that next step? Or not take the next step, but get to where we think they should be. I think there's still a lot we don't know about what what happened in that room and the dynamics of that room. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not going to suggest guys were, were punching each other Jonathan Allen style all year, but there was very clearly a, a gap between what that unit looked like when they were all working together as one and what was happening when they were all trying to freelance and make plays. And, and, and you know, the, the, they went off the rails, um, and, you know, whether that was self-imposed pressure or your lack of response to coaching. I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, but, you know, th this was a group that when they hit their stride, you, you saw it for a few minutes. It's a group that could communicate well, make plays, you know, be dynamic from the front to the back. But this was also a group that when they started looking out for themselves, it, it unraveled quickly. And it's funny because individually at times the play was really good. It's just that as a group, they didn't always work together the way you need. And, you know, for me, like, you've got to find that middle linebacker. You've got to find the quarterback of the defense for them to, to me, take that. That will be a big step in the process. And that, but that's assuming that the defensive line produces, you know, at a level that we sh think they should. So I, that's where, you know. Yeah, with, with Ioannidis and Settle leaving, you know, it's certainly a very interesting question is how that'll impact the unit as a whole. You know, those guys both really punched above their, their weight class there for being backups. You know, that was a luxury to have. Uh, it, it's a big loss. I, and I think, like, was, to me, the big loss is Settle 
be, mainly because if you knew you were going to cut Ioannidis, which they did before that point, you got you to gotta work hard to keep settle. I, I, always, I always thought very highly of settle. I think he's going to be a really good player in this league. I, I, that's not a hot take. You know, a lot of, a lot of people saw that, but I'll, I'll join you on the correct train by, by saying it out loud. Um, you, you know, and, and then you look in the secondary and, you know, what, what are you going to get out of St. Jude in year two? Are you, are you going to get a step forward there? Is Kendall Fuller maxed out? You know, it, 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 is he hit the level he's going to give you? I'm inclined to believe he is. I don't think he's ever going to be, a, you know, Wheaties box guy. I, I think he's just a solid NFL corner. But how do you make sure the rest of the unit plays to, to make sure he's in a spot where he needs to be to make plays? I kind of like that as a scouting term. You get like blue chip. You know, they get the red, the red mark, or is he a Wheaties box guy? I think that's like, they don't have enough Wheaties box guys here. Well, they got a lot of guys who think they're Wheaties box guys. That may be part of the problem. It's, it's the, it's the giant brand Wheaties box. It's not the regular <laughs> Wheaties box. That's the problem. But, but with, to your point with, with though, comes. There, you, there you go. But like, to your point though, and I love Kendall Fuller. I think he's very smart. If he is maxed yeah. out, he is a good corner. But can you get? But do you need better play from that spot overall? And that's where even eleven, they're going to be two. There may be a corner there, who I know Fritz Moot loves Derek Stingley, and I don't know that Sauce Gardner will be there. But you know, is that like if right now looking at this roster, is that an area you would go first, or is there some other area you would go there? I know it sounds crazy to say defense. I, look, if we're saying offense, we can say wide receiver, and I think it's a reasonable thing to say and a great position to add at. Um, you know, it's certainly the way the NFL is going. Nobody's going to nobody's going to argue with you for adding a receiver. But I do. I, I think, look, you've built your identity around this defense. There's still very clearly holes there that need to be filled. It, it would sting to, to go middle linebacker again the year after going linebacker. It's, it's a, that's a tough swallow your pride moment, but it, but, but it might be the way to go. Um, but there, there, there's a lot of secondary talent out there. Obviously, you, you mentioned a couple of guys at cornerback. Um, you know, is it the Notre Dame safety who's, who's getting a lot right. of run these days? You know, probably won't slide to him. Another guy where you say, you know, but you got to do your homework on. Right. And you know, th that's a great position to invest in in the NFL right now. It's, it's a copycat league. Uh, we just watched a Super Bowl with two teams, Aaron, you know, who, who made it there by airing it out. The best playoff game was Bill's Chiefs, two teams that, that make their living airing it out, uh, you know, with, with elite quarterbacks. You got to be ready to defend that. And if you're going to build your identity around defense, I think it's a reasonable way to go at number 11, setting the quarterback discussion aside, of course. And I think and I think it also, to your point, too, like I'm all for adding another receiver. I think I definitely would if, if they if they're there. This is a really deep draft at receivers. So I think the other thing you have to take into consideration when you pick an 11 what position offers most value at 11? First of all, take the best player. And if it's whatever, you know, if it's Drake London, Garrett Wilson, whomever. But you can all say like, well, is there a difference between the receivers here that big compared to the second round as opposed to cornerbacks? Or if Hamilton falls there, I mean, that's be a, to me a tremendous pick. And I think like to your point with the secondary, that big nickel, the Buffalo nickel is a spot they want to continue playing. And right now, I don't know that they have that guy to do that. I don't no know doubt. that he would be that guy either, but that's, that's something they want to continue. John, as you know, the thing about picking number 11 is you have more than one hole you can fill with that selection. Well, and, and when you go seven and 10, you have a few holes that you still will need. So yes, you can go. That's why I think I did, you know, I always joked about this. Like Greg, Greg Williams was here. It's like, he would, you know, Ryan O'Halloran and I always kind of joke about this because it was like, Greg would be like, well, people always ask me, Greg, what kind of players do you like? I like good football players. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Who doesn't? <laughs> but the point is, the point is you add the better, if you want to be a good team, you add the best talent and the best players. So at 11, that's what you do. Have you writing quarterback off the list at 11? It, no, I, it, me personally, no, I like, are we reporting that they probably won't take one? Yeah, I think everybody's saying that, 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 that we're certainly all leaning that they won't take one. It, would I personally take quarterback off the board? Absolutely not. If, 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 if you like one of those two, Pickett and Willis, I think, are your two that you're looking at there in that spot at 11. If you like one of those two and they're there, I think you take them. And, and you know, I just setting aside all the other considerations, it's the most important position in sports. So if you like a guy, I don't see any re reason to ever not go get him aside from some kind of, 
you know, Aaron Rodgers fit that's, that's going to happen, you know, where you got to manage egos. You should always take quarterbacks if you like. Now, do they love them, love them? That's the question. I, I, you know, I, I don't I don't know that that anybody's like falling head over heels with anybody at this point in the game. But if one of those guys is sitting there, I don't think either of them will be sitting there, by the way. But if one of them sitting there and you like him, I say go get him. My thing with the two, though, you just got Carson Wentz. You want to show commitment to him by taking a guy at 11. What message does that send? And, and is, is that important? To, to me, no. I, I, if Carson Wentz is the kind of guy who's going to get rattled by that, I want to learn that as soon as possible so that, so that I can start moving on. I, I understand what oh, we I would want to know that before I make that trade. <laughs> <laughs> I understand what went down in Philly, but I, I just don't see where on the Carson Wentz resume he, he comes in untouchable. Look, he's the starter over Taylor Heineke. He's an upgrade over Taylor Heineke, but, but is he untouchable? I I don't know, man. I think if you can upgrade, you, you keep upgrading there. That said, we, we go through this a lot of years in the draft where it's, oh, you know, the quarterbacks aren't good this year. Ah, don't worry about it. And then boom, boom, they're, they're gone right out of the gate. You know, there's teams that move up teams to get their guy. The other thing is if one of those two is still on the board at 11, I think you're at least fielding calls on a trade because that, that's, that's where your value is going to be. And I think that's the hope for them is that they're there, which is why I think they're going heavy on these pro days. Sometimes, like, as you know, and you were at Malik Willis's pro day. So you know that yeah. sometimes these teams go there for a lot of, oops, I just threw a pen in the air. How's that? Um, they go there for a lot of different reasons. And um, it can be, obviously, you want to get to know the guy. You want to get to have a comparison. Like, if you like Desmond Ritter, Ritter in the second round, you want to see how he compares to Malik Willis, to Kenny Pickett, to get a better, accurate judgment. But you also want other teams to know that maybe you're interested. So if they want to get this guy, then maybe you got to move up. And I think, you know, that's where, like, can they entice Pittsburgh to jump to 11 if they really want Malik Willis? So, you know. Everybody's favorite thing is trade back in the draft. Yes. You got to trade back in the draft. You got to get more picks. There's a reason more teams don't. And that's because every team knows right. it's a good thing to do. You, you need right. a buyer in order to be a seller. And in most years, that's not there. But if one of those two were still on the board, I think it's the rare year where you would have the potential to be a value seller, move move back and say, hey, th this is a good opportunity. So what kind of, going back to earlier with Wentz and all that and need to be a playoff team, what kind of pressure does this put on Rivera to produce that? Yeah, and, and no pressure that didn't already exist. And I, I think that was part of his off season. And, you know, he... We, we can, I, I guess, parse the language, but I feel like he maybe blew up the balloon a little too much here in terms of we're going to chase these elite quarterbacks. We feel we're on the door. And, you know, he's making his sales pitch to those guys directly. Um, we learned that the league uh, does not have the same value for this team that, that he has. Um, you know, that the, the league has, you know, they, they don't see this as a team on the verge of big things. None of those big name free agents, you know, came here and, you know, really gave them the time of day and the thought to it. But, but in terms of can they make the playoffs? I, st I, I don't know. I'm on team Rivera here. I, th I think the answer is yes. I think it's a solid, well-constructed roster. I think it's a third year guy who's got largely got his system in. I don't know. Tell, tell me what I'm not seeing here. Cakes. I, I, no, I, I don't I'm, think I'm, it's fair to say they could do it. And I, I also think when you look at the defense, the schedule of the quarterbacks are facing is not the same. So that, that helps them. So when I, you know, you look at the NFC East is Wentz the second best quarterback in this division right now. Yeah. It, it's it's a crazy thing to, a crazy thing to think about, but I, you know, I, and look, the Cowboys are due for their implosion because they, they seem to function somewhat normally last year. So, uh, you know, that, that's the way, that's the way things turn down there in Dallas. But I, yeah, I, I think Carson Wentz, while he is not the guy and the answer, I, I don't think he's that. I think he represents solid production, which, you know, what's funny. It, it's what they thought they were getting last year in Fitzpatrick. It, it's essentially, you know, round two of here's a guy who can come in and do what we need him to do. Well, and you know, and it's funny because I know when I talk to people about him, I know all the flaws with him. We all know that, but if they got the same production out of him here, I think compared like the Colts are measuring him against Phillip Rivers. Do you know what I mean? And, and Andrew Locke and guys like oh, that. And they, they just went out and got themselves another elite quarterback. Right. It's insane. Right, right. And, you know, that's going to lead to another question in a minute. But like for Wentz here, he doesn't have that same level of comparison to previous years. I mean, we're not talking 
a bunch of Pro Bowls or in the Hall of Famers who have traveled through here in recent years. No, look at Denver, man. Denver courts Aaron Rodgers, like really wants Aaron Rodgers, all in for Aaron Rodgers. And you know, you don't always get what you want in life, John. And they had to settle for Russell Wilson. <laughs> what, what, what a world that must be. Indianapolis, you know, like we've got a Carson Wentz, like this is nonsense. This is an unacceptable level of production. Go get me a Matt Ryan, you know, like just call, call and get whoever we're going to get. Like they don't play in that world. Like, and you know, we haven't seen that in so, so long. I, I do think he'll be more appreciated here than he was there for sure. And can they, and like, the other thing is to get those kind of guys, because first of all, do you think that the Ryan moves and all that, would you have, would that have altered how you approach, if you were Washington, how you would have approached the Wentz trade? Would you have waited and get in the hindsight? Or do you say like, this wasn't going to happen here, it doesn't matter, they had to make it then? This wasn't going to happen here. And here's the message that the, that the fans need to hear. You know, in the Falcons said, this is Stafford last year, Ryan this year. When you have those guys who are the core identity of these teams for, for de you know, a, a decade or longer, the team wants to do right by them. They don't want to send them out, uh, you know, to, to blow out their knee in FedEx field in week two. They, they, they want to get their input, do right by them, uh, you know, send them to a place where, where they want to be and are appreciated and, you know, can come back and have a Jersey retirement night uh, down the line where, where there's no hard feelings either way. It wasn't going to happen. Teams are not sending their guys here because guys don't want to come here. And we could do a three hour long podcast diving into why that is. And I think very little of it is Ron Rivera's fault. And I think it's a frustration of Ron's that you, you, we hear it so often, you get guys, I don't want to talk about the past. Guys, we're looking forward here. We're looking forward into the future. I understand the frustration, but we've been here, man. We've seen right. it and, and we know why that exists. And, you know, by the way, a three hour podcast, our friend Ben Standard, Standard would call that part one. So, that's a warm up. That's just a warm up. There that's, just, that's, that's his opening <laughs> monologue. So, um, but <laughs> <laughs> shout out Ben. But along with that, like my theory and my contention has been, this is one area where Wentz can help them. If you can go out and have a couple of 10 win seasons in a row, win a couple of playoff games, does the perception then change? Does in a couple of years, are we looking at something different if they're able to go do that? And it's got to yeah, be a couple years in a row. Oh, it has to be. And I believe Ron is well liked in, in league circles. And, and certainly he's bringing a lot of juice to this. I think it's everything else around the franchise that's not. So yeah, you know, if you could, if you could go back to back 10 win seasons, absolutely. I think people would, would re look, re refresh how they look at it. But I also think you know this power in Ashburn is directly proportional to what you happen to be producing that day. Right. Ron, Ron has power now. Ron runs the place. But if Ron were to put together back-to-back 10-win -back seasons, he would be Gibbs-like. He would be fully untouched. Like, you you run 10 back-to-back, -back, you can do whatever you want. He, it's a he dynasty call, here these days. He would call 100% of the shots in that building, and that would ease people's fears, too. Of like, oh, you know, am I going to send my... Am I going to send my guy there? Right. They have a bad year. The owner overreacts. Ron's gone. He's in a bad situation. Like you, you, you string together a couple tens, you're untouchable. And I also think players want to see, you know, because it's Denver. Russell Wilson picked Denver where they we don't even know who the owner is. They yeah. have a new coach, but because they have won in recent years, the perception is that they're going to do it again. And they do have a good roster. So I don't blame them there, but that's why I say, like, if, I think players also need to know, I mean, the Bengals are now attractive for players. And like that, it was why, because of Joe Burrow, because they won. So players want to go where you can win too. And if they show they can win, at least to that point, 10 wins, 11 wins, again, win a playoff game or two. Then I think, then I think the perception starts to change. I think. Yeah. It, it, you know, look, look at Tyreek Hill in Kansas city. I mean, what, if these guys had a talent at that level, they would never ever trade him. The chiefs can have that confidence of like, look, we'll just call another good receiver. Tell him, come play with Patrick Mahomes. Like, you know, right. that's a, right. that's a draw. Right. Speaking of that, because I wanted to get to that. What do you do with Terry McLaurin now? Because look at where these receivers are going and like, you can't lose Terry McLaurin, but my God, the money. <laughs> You have to pay him. And let's set the football aside for a minute. He's really good at football. We both know that. But let's set the football aside for a minute. This is a franchise that is working hard to convince the, the ticket holders and the fans 
we hear you, we are changing for you, we are moving in a more fan-friendly direction. Talk to any fan, what, what do they want to see? They want Terry McLaurin here for the long term. Like it's only, Terry McLaurin has it. He, he's got all the leverage. You have to hand him a blank check and say, fill in your number, fine, it's a lot of money, we'll do it. He, but you have to find a way to keep him here because if you continue this trend of, you know, sheriff leaves and cousins leaves and now you know if you if you play this tag game with mclaurin for a couple of years and he leaves you the fans see that and react negatively to that fans want to know that when they fall in love with this guy they will be able to root for him for the next decade and buy a jersey and feel good about it and you know i one time had it espn hand me a blank check i gave it back and fill it out and they erased a couple zeros in the decimal points <laughs> didn't quite work out for me but um but I, but the thing, the hard part is like, if you just strip away, like I agree with everything you say about McLaurin, what he means to the franchise and the fan base. And you can't afford another hit with them. You no. just can't. They've been through too much. But the flip side is from a talent standpoint, our receivers getting to the point where it's like, it's hard to pay them that much because they keep, the draft keeps producing really good classes. But as we've seen around the same round, it's been age, Antonio Gandy Goldman and Deami Brown, who are not Terry McLaurin. So it's not like it's a given just because there's depth, but I just, I'm with you. Like McLaurin means too much to this franchise. You, you would be really hard. I think it, you know, you just, you can't. If you want to build with the right guys, he's the right guy. And I he's think right that's, the, you know, so um, two more things. I know you got to go. Do you have a stadium update for us? What's going on there? You know, it's going to be a very interesting week and a half there. So obviously owners meetings, of course, the stadium committee will meet. So we'll, we'll, I'll be curious to see if any updates come out of that. Um, Virginia was such a far and away clubhouse leader coming into the legislative session. They put a billion dollars on the table and look, nobody's coming near that. Um, the, the word is, is not going to be a billion dollars when they're done with it. And I think a little of that is the legislators kind of got spooked and said, shoot, are we negotiating against ourselves here? Um, I think it's still going to be a really good package when it comes in. I think April 4th is the day for that when that when that finally comes back in. I think it's still going to be half a bill, which is still, I mean, Maryland's sitting on 200 million, DC sitting on, maybe we'll get our act together someday. So it, it's it's still a winning number by by a large margin, but it's 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 less of the jaw dropper that it was initially. So I I think it puts those other two back in play, um, but I, I think Maryland pushing the FedEx field site is ultimately a negative for them too. I, I know it's easy to build on that site, but take, setting aside the railings and the fires, fire extinguishers and all that, like it's still a bad location and a bad location to reach the Northern Virginia fans and a bad location in terms of proximity to, to Metro and traffic and staging night games, you know, Monday night games have always been a disaster there. Um, it's a bad location. Um, so so I, I think Maryland choosing to go in on that site, DC with a site they don't even own an RFK, I, I still think Virginia has got to be considered the clubhouse leader. So last thing, um, combine this with the Anheuser-Busch pulling out and, you know, people can infer why they did that. They didn't give the official statement. They didn't say anything on there. You can make your own inferences, whatever. How much of that, do you, you know, combined with like what you hear from politicians about the ownership here is how big an issue will that be for them to get this done? Is that a big deal or not? Man, I'm excited to get an update on that this weekend. I, I don't know when this is going to post, you know, we're going to the owners meeting this weekend. It's, it, it's going to be fascinating to take the temperature of that room. And is there an appetite to move him along? Not, not even because of the sexual harassment stuff, but just because as a league, you have to do business with Anheuser-Busch. Like you can't lose accounts like that, you know, at the NFL level, it's too big of a business. I am very curious, what is the, what is the vibe among those other 31 owners? Is it this is a breaking point. We've got to go, which was, which was the Florio report before the Super Bowl that, that the mood was turning on Dan, or is it we are very mad at him and we'll continue to let him know we are very mad at him. I think that's story. it. But what and about I, the, I think I think that's it too. I think that's it too. But but I'll be curious to take the temperature of the room. How about politicians for the stadium? Is that is it an issue for them? No, because they want legacy projects. They want big buildings and, and economic development. And look, I mean. The learners aren't, aren't known as like, you know, Mother Teresa's or anything like, you know, but but everybody wanted to pony up for Nats Park. Virginia wanted that. D.C. wanted that. I'm, I'm sure Maryland it, it at least kicked the tires around. If there's an NFL stadium up for bids, that transcends how you feel about that person in that moment. I can tell you to think. 
and that will end right there. And my legacy project, I'm not building a stadium, but I'm trying to fix some drywall in the in my basement. It's not going so well. It's not the legacy I want to leave. So there you we're go. Getting, we're, we're getting a new roof here. And so I'll just put the word out. If any corporate sponsors want to sponsor <laughs> that project, get your name on the new roof in Richmond. Good visibility. Uh, you know, some, sometimes we, we invite the beat writers over during training camp. I, I think I think it's a it's a lucrative project. I will talk to ZZQ and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Michael, we'll, we'll see you in our, in, down in Florida. And thank you very much for coming on. Looking forward to it. Hey, everybody, it's John Kine. Do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, and I'll continue to bring you guests who provide excellent insight into the Washington Commanders. And while you're here, check out the other terrific content on the Empire Media Network, including Inside the Cap with Joel Corey and All's Caps with Steve Wino and former Washington Capitol Carl Alsner. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button. Thank you.